So, good evening, everyone. And the first, first thing, can everybody hear? Sounds okay? Well, I want to first of all thank Zoe, Sister Zoe, for inviting me here at Newman College. It is really a privilege and an honor to give this lecture. Um, you know, apparently I'm the first McCaffrey lecturer, and, uh, <laughs> but Michael, it's really a great honor. I'm, I'm going to say some things about you at the end. Which will, no, which will make more sense in the whole context of this lecture. As long as it's uh, not true. Okay. <laughs> okay. I want to thank a few other people before I start. Two of them here in Bishop Jerry Wiesner and Father Don McDonald Franciscan is here. Um, they brought me to Newman College 44 years ago. I was nine years old at the time. Okay. Uh, and, and my years at Newman College completely shaped the rest of my life. So I want to thank you, Don. Don was the president at the time. Jerry was my superior, and that's uh, where I met Father Mike McCaffrey, who was my principal or president for a number of years, and uh, he was a good president. Okay, the topic. And I'm kind of sorry that Zoe didn't give me that choice of topic about cows and curvatures and so on. So on. Uh, she asked me to speak on this, a revolution of tenderness in the papacy of Pope Francis. Now, I want to do it, they're not even, I want to do just five things with you. Just a very quick word of introduction about those terms. Tenderness, revolution. And then I want to talk about Pope Francis' intent. What's the intent of this so-called revolution? Then I want to highlight his, his, his approach. I posit some, some uh, major pastoral issues, but I want to name these more than explain them. But then I want to talk about his biblical basis for doing what he's doing. And then there's gonna be an epilogue. Uh, it'll be good, Michael. Uh, <laughs> just the appropriateness of this topic for the McCaffrey lectures. Just the appropriateness of the question of a revolution of tenderness in the papacy of Pope Francis. Okay. Very briefly first. Um, am I seeing the same things? Okay. Well, just a little bit of uh, an introduction on the words, you know. A, re a revolution of tenderness. I think the word revolution doesn't need much explanation. We often talk about revolution as opposed to evolution. Evolution, slow, gradual, incremental change that changes through the years. Revolution is more radical change. It's a shift. It's a paradigm shift. It's more radical. So it's, it, and I think we can talk about that in Francis as, as a revolution more than a, an evolution. And secondly, the word tenderness. You know, the word tenderness can easily take on sentimental stuff, you know, the tender and so on. And there is an element of sentiment in it. But biblically, we're going to see it's, <laughs> it's, it's harder, it's, it's, it's a hard concept. So it, it, it connotes a certain mercy and something that's a, that doesn't oppose itself, but that kind of mitigates juridical justice. You know, you have juridical justice, an eye for an eye. This is the law, and so on. And then there's mercy. There's something that mitigates that. It's called tenderness. You know, that's, and that's not a sentimental thing at all. That's a, that's, that's a hard virtue. But there is a sentimental thing, in, in, and that's well, tenderness always speaks of warmth rather than coldness. You know, nobody can associate the word coldness with the word tender. Okay? They don't go together. So tenderness connotes a certain warmth, a certain mercy. Now, a revolution of tenderness in Pope Francis, its intent. And here I'm just gonna, I'm gonna walk through these um, rather quickly, because I'm gonna get to the biblical parts and some of the other parts, but I really wanna highlight this, this, is, this is very important. See, Pope Francis, in, when he took over, right from the moment he was brought out of the balcony and refused to wear certain vestments, he was making a statement that there was going to be a certain shift, and a large shift, okay? But this is the intent of the shift, and he has made this very, very clear sense, and that is the intent is not to change dogma or to change any essential discipline, you know? And sometimes, you know, um, uh, the hard right as to so these, these changing is going to change dogmas. So Francis said not to change a single dogma and not to change any, a, a single essential discipline, 
but to look at how we do pastoral practice within those dogmas and within that essential discipline. So that's the second thing. See, his intent is not to change the truth, it's to, encha it's to change our ethos. You know, um, that's a vague word and yet it's, 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 it's a clear word. At all given times, it's political, we have it in politics by the church, there's a clerical, there's an ethos, there's an ecclesial ethos, you know? And, and this isn't abstract. For instance, prior to Vatican II, with Pope Pius XII, the, the, the three Pope Piuses, there was a certain ecclesial ethos. Then John XXIII also intended the revolution, and he changed, tried to say, I want open windows. You notice he didn't say, I'm going to change dogmas. He said, I'm going to open some windows. We're petrifying, we're, the, the air is stale. And he says, we're going to change the ethos. And Vatican II did change the ethos. Then the years succeeding Vatican II, slowly the ethos changed again. I'm not even saying for good or for bad. These are your own judgments and, and, and we leave them to the Holy Spirit and so on. And then um, after the papacy of John Paul, which was a long and, and, a, and, a, and a noble papacy, you know, he's one of the great popes ever. And, uh, you know, Benedict, Francis said, it's time for an ethos change. Ethos change doesn't mean any change of doctrine, any change of essential discipline. And I'm going to try to say what that means in terms of grounding metaphors for ecclesiology. Now, this next part, Pope Francis puts this out clearly time and time again. He said, you know what kind of church I want? He said, I want, I want, I want the church to radiate more God's mercy and God's tenderness. He's very clear. He said, I want the church to radiate more God's tenderness and especially tenderness for the poor. He's very clear, he said, I want a church for the poor and a church of the poor. Um, and we'll come on that later. And he said, and, and the intent is to make God's mercy and tenderness to, to show it forth for the poor. And he's very clear on that. He said, this is the kind of church I want. And he said, and this is the kind of church I want to work towards. And kind of, you're in, if you're not for me, then you're against me. And, um, and then the next one, the intent is to make God look better. <laughs> Let me see why I say this. <laughs> I was once asked by a journalist. She said, you know, the church, you have you know, sexual abuse crisis and this, we have this. He said, no, it's, it's Pope Francis' intent just to make the church look better. I said, no. He's trying to make God look better. You know, the, ch <laughs> the church we incarnate and give life to, it, that's the face of God for most people. And sometimes it doesn't look very good at all. See, Francis says a church that doesn't radiate God's mercy, doesn't radiate the face of God, and it doesn't make God look very good. If we make God look legalistic, if we make God look stingy, if we make God look unprodigal, we're not doing God a favor. We're not doing the church a favor. You know, see, we have a God of infinite mercy, a prodigal God. You know, we take the parable of the sower. You know, you have to be a farmer to realize how radical that parable is. Where Jesus says, a sower went out to seed, threw some seed on the road, into the ditch, into the thorns, into rocky ground, and onto some good land. My dad was a farmer. No farmer seeds like that. <laughs> okay. And the reason why farmers don't seed like that, because they have limited seed. And they try only to get into the good soil. But God, it's infinite. It's just infinite. And uh, anything that, that, that speaks of limit, of stinginess or whatever, it, it, it's not the God of Jesus and so on. You know, the, 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 the prodigalness of God, sometimes you, you, you can stretch our minds that even by looking at physical creation. You know, today, science will tell you that you know, when, when they try to look at the physical universe, and since the Big Bang and so on, they say, we have hundreds of millions of galaxies. We have whole, all throwaway galaxies. And so what God does that, you know? Uh, you gotta be pretty prodigal to do that. And there's billions of light years between galaxies. I was sitting beside a scientist at a, at a banquet last year. So I said to the scientist, I said, do you believe in life on other planets? He said, as a scientist, no. He said, there's almost no chance there's life on another planet at least in, in terms of our Big Bang Theory and so on. 
He said, as a Christian, I do. I said, well, I said, why would God only have one kid? <laughs> okay. He said, most parents have a couple, and some have quite a few. He said, you know, this is a pretty good child God is going. He said, why would he only do this once, you know? Uh, see, our God is prodigal. And Francis is coming out of, he's, he's coming out of a whole theology of God's abundance. And that's why he's preaching so much mercy. You don't have to be stingy with mercy. It's not, it's not, it doesn't end. You know, uh, our sacramental theologian in, in, in San Antonio, he's been teaching sacramental theology for 43 years. And he said only two years ago, he first got this question from the seminarians. He was teaching about penance. Seminarians asked, when can we refuse absolution? When do we have to refuse absolution? He said, well, never. Now, these are sincere young men. Don't remember, but see, they're scared. What if we give out mercy cheaply? Or, or what if somehow we give it out and there isn't enough or whatever? See, we're not making God look very good. See, so the journalist says, is Francis trying to make the church look better? No, he's trying to make God look better. And then the church will also look better. But more importantly, I mean, underneath this, he's trying to change our grounding metaphors. Oops. Okay. You know, um, psychologists will tell you this. They say, consciously or unconsciously, we're always working out of certain grounding metaphors. And oftentimes they're unconscious to us. What's the metaphor of the church we're working out of and so on? And Francis is trying to change a few fundamental grounding metaphors. And the first one has to do with the world. He said, we need to see the world, you know, the world out this back. He said, you need to see that as not as your enemy, but as our child. You know, and he's right. You know, somebody's talking about how bad the world is, this terrible world out there. You know what they're talking about? They're talking about your kids. They're talking about the people you teach. Well, your kids aren't that bad. At least not sometimes. Okay. Uh, see, but your children are never your enemy. They're your child. And sometimes they're belligerent. Sometimes they make terrible mistakes. Sometimes they're in your face. But they're your children. They're not your enemies. And you're going to see, especially with, with some of the, the moral issues you're going to look at, like abortion. He said, these pro-choice people, they're not our enemies. These are our families. These are our sisters and brothers and so on. There is no them and us. There's only an us. You know, so he said the grounding metaphor, if you see the world as your enemy, then you know what's going to happen? It's the other metaphors. You're going to get defensive. You're going to start protecting and so on. He said, no, you don't protect yourself against your own children. So that's the first grounding metaphor. It, the world isn't our enemy, it's our child. Secondly, he says, which do you pick? The church as a treasury of truths and as a fortress to be protected? or as a field hospital to which the world comes and brings its wounds. You know, what's their grounding metaphor of what many of us in here were in ministry and so church? What's the church for? You know, well, the danger is, and, and the church has a treasury of truths. And, and the church has, a, in a certain sense, that we are a fortress. But that's not our, our we exist for, like he uses the image, I love the image. We're a field hospital. You know, we're not, we're not here to protect ourselves or the church. Let me give you an example. When I'm going to give the, the, the expression here in, of, of two, two cardinals answering the same question. Okay. Some years ago, and I won't mention this, oh, this he was a wonderful man, very sincere um, person. But a cardinal in the United States was asked on National Public Radio, and this journalist said to him, she says, uh, Your Eminence, she says, what's the most important single agenda as you've just been ordained a cardinal, you're taking over a new diocese, what's the most important agenda for the church today? And a very sincere man, he says, we need to defend and protect the faith. The faith is under siege today, okay? I once heard Cardinal, heard cardinal Hume ask that exact same question. Someone said, your eminence, what's the first item of importance and agenda for the church today? And Hume said, as it's always been, we're supposed to try to save this planet. Notice those are two very different answers. Mm -hmm. We need to protect ourselves. We need to try to save the world. Now, I don't have to tell you which one is closer to Jesus. Remember, Jesus says, my flesh is food for the life of the world. Now, notice he didn't even say, my flesh is food for the life of the church. My flesh is food for the life of the world. 
That's why symbolically you have this beautiful imagery where Jesus is born and laid in a manger. Why a manger? Because it's a feeding trough for animals. You know, that beautiful song, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. Jesus was born, they lay him in a feeding trough where animals come to eat. He ends up on an altar, a table where humans come to eat. Jesus says, I've come to be eaten up by the world. And notice in, in, in the Gospels, every time they protect Jesus, he said, try to protect him, disciples. We don't want kids, prostitutes, tax collectors. Jesus says, I can handle it. <laughs> I can handle it. And Jesus doesn't protect himself to the point of letting himself be killed. You know, see, Francis says, you know, we, we, we need to not... You know, we have, a we have a beautiful church. We have a beautiful treasury of truths, and that, that, that is its own importance. But that's not what we're about. The church isn't about saving itself. The church is supposed to be about saving the world. See, again, it's a grounding metaphor. And then this one is less important, but less, you know, kind of um, grounding, but very important. Um, he also says, all of us who do ministry we have to be very, very careful that we don't make this a clerical endeavor. And that's his famous thing. You're going to be a good person for the church if you smell like the sheep. That's one of his metaphors, you know. Uh, you got, we got to smell like the flock. Okay. Um, that, that's his intent. Okay. Now, very briefly, and each of these would be a whole... Um, I'm missing something. Um, go back. I want to give you that line from Robert Lax. Okay. Robert Lax, remember, he was a great friend of Merton. He was probably Merton's biggest lifelong friend. They had been students together, and, and Merton went off to a monastery, and Lax went off to Greece and became this kind of hermit monk for the rest of his life, writing books, and he's written some wonderful books. But Lax once said, the task in life is not just to find a path along which to walk, but also to find a rhythm to walk within. It's a wonderful distinction. We gotta find a path, but then you have to find your rhythm in which you can walk inside of that path. Now, Francis says, our truths and our dogmas, they are mapped out for us. We don't have to look for a new path. We have to find a way of walking pastorally, carrying God's mercy and God's tenderness in, as we walk along that path. No, it's just a different way of saying what I said at the beginning. He says, I'm not trying to change any dogmas. I'm not trying to change any of the essential disciplines in the church. I'm saying inside of them, we got to put a merciful face. Um, we have to find a different ethos. We have to find maybe a different rhythm than we've been finding of late. Okay, now, highlighting Francis' approach. Okay. You see it, in, in, and I'm just going to mention some of these and some of his famous statements on each. First of all, communion for persons in irregular situations. From day one, this was a big thing for him, you know. And he's looking at our world, again, as these are our kids, and he's saying, today, what used to be normal is now elitist. <laughs> that, and what used to be irregular is now kind of almost the new norm. So he's saying, so many people have a disastrous first marriage. You know, that's really true. So often, you know, to, to do, and we know that. We all fall in love with people for all the wrong reasons and the wrong people. He said, so, so many people, young people, they get in a disastrous first marriage, which is actually, it's, it's not life-giving. It's taking their life away from them. And sometimes it's positively abusive or whatever, but it's not life-giving. It's deadening. So that then they get out of such a relationship and oftentimes get into a second relationship, which is life-giving. Now, this is vintage Francis. He says, we got to look at our formatting. He says, the irony is you look at that and you look at that first situation, which was unhappy and was really death-dealing. You say, that was a sacrament. Now they're in a life-giving situation. You say, now you're living in sin. <laughs> he said, we got to rethink. No, he's not trying to change the laws. He says, you know, where does that formatting lead us? And that formatting had its, its own value and so on. But he said, we, we have to rethink this. Like, how, if, if this is the new norm and so on, well, why do we say they're living in sin? And this was a sacrament. Um, now, in, in, in the way we've been formatting it, that all makes sense. But that's a certain software, you know. And inside of that software, it makes sense. 
our world no longer lives inside that software. I studied at classical theology, it's wonderful, you know, but it's a certain Microsoft, and uh, <laughs> now people don't, and that's why people oftentimes are upset with the church. You know, or even some instances, you know, where the church said, well, this is an intrinsic wrong or something. When that was written, it makes sense inside of that software. Your kids are reading it outside of that software. This is terrible. The church is judging us and so on. Uh, it isn't, but to them it is. So Francis said we have to look at, uh, to use a lack of a better image, the software within which we, we conceive these things. So just to insert a little humor here. When I was living in Belgium, the American College, the seminary, we had a woman there, very colorful woman. She worked in maintenance, you know, the, you know cleaning and so on. And, um, and she was a little like the woman at the well, the you know, Samaritan woman. You know, she had about five or six husbands and probably living with somebody who wasn't her husband and so on. And um, I'm a very colorful woman. And so one day the Cardinal, Cardinal Daniels, came to visit. And we're all in this reception line. So, of course, he's asking each person, what do you do? And making a little conversation. He gets to her, her name was Barbara. He said, so, what do you do? He says, well, I actually work in maintenance and cleaning and so on. And just so he said, um, are you married? She said, well, your eminence says, yes, no. She said, actually, your eminence, I'm living in sin. <laughs> and they both burst out laughing. <laughs> okay. Francis would also laugh. Our birth control. Now, again, Francis isn't changing anything on birth control. He's saying, but we, we, we have to be, in terms of where do we prioritize that in our teaching? It is a moral issue. Where do we put that? And how do we reach out to that pastorally? and so on. And then same with homosexuality. You're all familiar with these famous line. Who am I to judge? I want to talk about that when we talk about judgment in scripture or abortion. What Francis is saying, you know, abortion, he said, we need to, he's, he's against abortion. He is pro-life through and through and through. But he's saying, we need to listen to these women. We need to listen to these people. And you know something, three years ago on Christmas day in New York City, the pro-choice women ran a full-page ad in the New York Times, and they said, thank you, Pope Francis, you're the first pope who ever listened to us. Now, he didn't say you who agreed with us. He said, we're grateful you listened to us. You heard us, you know? Um, so again, he's saying, we're not changing things, but we need, we need dialogue, we need openness, we need to talk to these people. And then on confession, he's been really strong. To priests, he said, Confession is the road to mercy. In one of his letters, he says to priests, he said, if you're hearing confessions and you can't find a road to mercy for the person in front of you, he said, then stop hearing confessions. He said, don't tell a sick person you're too sick to see the doctor, because that's what you're doing. It's quite a line. You don't tell a sick person you're too sick to see the doctor. He said, that's what you're doing if you're refusing mercy. He said, your task is to find the road to mercy. That's why you're there. Okay. And, um, you know, just give you, again, I'm, I'm rolling dice here. I may as well be strong. You know, um, it depends who your moral theologian was and how you were taught to handle these. But, for instance, in canon law, abortion is a reserved sin. So you're a priest sitting a confession. Somebody comes to you and says, I've committed the abortion. And then, you're, then if you say to the person, well, I can't forgive you, you've got to go to the bishop. What do you think the chances are the person's ever going to go to the bishop? Phone the transfer office, you know, I had an abortion. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not going to happen. You know, my moral theologian was a very conservative, but a very good moral theologian. He says, no. He said, canon law also says, if they are in distress, you can forgive them. He said, so simply ask them, does this bother you? Of course it bothers them. That's why they're there. Then you can forgive that sin. You know, Francis is saying, do these things. See, you're not changing any of the laws. You're not even changing canon law. You're just being merciful and compassionate within the law. Okay, and you're taking God's mercy there. So basically, as I say there, he challenges us to meet these situations with compassion and tenderness rather than with juridical and canonical rigidity. You know, see, there's two ways you can be in any pastoral situation <clears throat> or somewhere in between of that. We can meet it with compassion, with tenderness. Notice I'm not even saying what your decision is. 
Sometimes it might be a hard decision, but it's given with compassion and tenderness rather than with juridical and canonical rigidity. Now, I want to make a little footnote on this. He challenged us to first listen to the soul before we try to save a soul. You ever thought of that? You know, one of the mentors in my life has been, he was an agnostic, James Hillman. He was just this brilliant, brilliant agnostic philosopher who died two years ago. And it's interesting, Hillman was an agnostic, but probably more than anybody I've ever read, he made a plea for the human soul. And Hillman says, you know, he says, nobody gets the soul. You know, if you want to read the most radical book you've ever read, he wrote a book way back in the 60s called Suicide of the Soul, James Hillman. And there he says, he says, doctors and psychiatrists, they're always trying to fix the soul. He said, and clergy are trying to save the soul. He said, but the soul doesn't need to be fixed or saved. It's already eternal. You know, you don't have to save a soul, he said, but souls have to be heard. Then he says, you know who heard the soul? He said, as, as a, and, no, and actually he's soft of the church. He said, the church is one of the few instruments and organizations that has somehow had a sense of the soul. Incidentally, he's the man who mentored the young Thomas More, who wrote all those books on care of the soul, soulmates, and so on. Um, and he also mentored a lot of other people who are writing what they call soul, writing on soul. And he says, you go back, it's very interesting, Freud and Jung. Freud and Jung, they were living at a time when materialism, like 19th century kind of mechanism was at the strongest, you know. Human beings are machine. And you know, that's where science was moving, psychology was moving, and so on. And they stopped moving there because they started, they were dealing with sick people. They were dealing with people who were insane. There were people who were suicidal. People who were obsessed. People who were having breakdowns. And Jung said, that's where you hear the soul speak. And somebody who's suicidal, you hear the soul speak. Somebody who's wounded, who's obsessed, who's going insane. He said, you hear the plea of the soul. And Hillman says, we need to listen to the soul long before you get about saving it. That's also Pope Francis. Different language, different formatting. Francis, we got to hear the soul. You don't have to agree with abortion. You got to hear what these women are saying. You don't have to agree with homosexual marriages. Right? You have to hear what these people are saying. He said, we got to hear the soul, you know. And then we still have our dogmas and everything else, and we, we work with that. Okay, now, a little bit, his biblical basis for that, okay? And there's a number of them. I'm just going to highlight some, which is Jesus' perennial critique of the scribes and the Pharisees. That was Sunday's gospel, you know? And uh, <laughs> whenever I preach on the scribes and the Pharisees, I tell people this. They're surprised. I said, you know something? The scribes and Pharisees were the good religious people of the time. You know, we always think scribes and Pharisees were these hypocrites and so on. No, today we're the scribes and Pharisees in this room right now. We're the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus came from the school of the Pharisees. These were good, sincere, religious people. But you know what happened so often? They would let their very religiosity become a blockage for God's mercy and the flow of God's mercy. Remember Sunday's Gospel? where the gospel of Jesus says, you lay heavy burdens on men's shoulders, you don't lift a finger to lift those burdens off. See, we're sincere, good people, the religious people at the time, but in our sincerity, in our religiosity, oftentimes we place our religiosity between others and God's mercy. Incidentally, that is the deep meaning of the cleansing of the temple. You know, that the, the cleansing of the temple. What, what's the dynamic in the cleansing of the temple? And John's gospel, John chapter 2, makes it the clearest. The synoptics have it, but John has it the clearest. It's this. Why does Jesus chase the money changes out of the temple? They had a very important function to be there. You know, they, people have to exchange money. You know, when you go to a foreign country, when you get off the airplane, the first thing you do is exchange money. You got to change into euros and into different, so that you can operate in that country. You need their currency. Well, people came to the temple from all over the world, from Greece, wherever, and they brought their currency, but they had to buy animals and so on to sacrifice. They would have to change their money into Jewish currency. And so the, the, the problem was when Jesus said, you've turned my house 
in, in, into a house of commerce. He's not talking about commercial commerce. <laughs> you know, if you go to New Cathedral in Los Angeles, they have a Starbucks in the entrance. It's wonderful. <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have any trouble with that at all. He'd probably stop and have a latte, you know. <laughs> it's not so much that they're selling religious articles or something. They were saying, you got to go through us to worship God. So your currency doesn't work. You got to change Greek drachma into Jewish shekels or you can't worship God. So you got to change your currency into another kind of currency or you can't worship God. And Jesus removes them. He says, nothing sits between there. Actually, it's pretty radical. I think it's what got him crucified. That was the final straw that broke the camel's back, you know, because it began to upset commerce itself and so on. You know, so that, uh, you know, Jesus puts that another way. Remember his, his, his uh, dialogue with the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman says, you know, I'm a Samaritan, and the Jews say you have to worship at Mount, at, in Jerusalem. The Samaritans say you have to worship at Mount Gerasim. So where do you worship? Where's the real temple? And Jesus says, you don't have to go to either of those places. The temple is inside of your heart. Christianity is, <laughs> we're a religion of translation. And all languages and all currency works, okay? And see, we have to be careful that we don't get our own currency in the, between us and God. Or that other image in scripture where uh, they're trying to bring a paralytic to Jesus and the crowd won't let him bring him through. It's quite an interesting thing. They gotta make a hole in the roof and drop him down. See, the crowd is preventing somebody to come to Jesus, you know? In our religiosity, we oftentimes, in all good sincerity, end up doing that. You know, that we're, we become the money changers. If Jesus came back today, he'd, he wouldn't take a whip to the people at Starbucks in the cathedral. But he might take a whip to a lot of our parish teams, <laughs> other people <laughs> who are saying, you're going through me. You can't, you know. Um, and, and again, don't get me wrong, I'm not against programmatic stuff and so on. But sometimes, again, in all sincerity, we begin to block God's mercy. Your kid ain't being baptized unless you go through me. You know, you're not going to be forgiven unless you go through me, and so on. Um, Jesus is kind of harsh on the scribes and Pharisees, who were good, sincere, religious people. Okay, then secondly, his dialogue with the border on the borders of Samaria with that Syrophoenician woman. Okay. That's an interesting story, as the Irish would say. It's an interesting story altogether. <laughs> um, it's in Mark's Gospel, it's in Matthew's Gospel. They say one day Jesus was walking along the borders of Samaria when he met a woman. Full stop. That's not an entry to a homily. That is the deep homily. You know, in, in the New Testament, borders always mean something more than, geography always means more than geography. He's on the edges. He's on the edges of what? Samaria was a different Ethnicity, different religion, different language, different culture. Okay? So he's standing on the borders of new, of ethnicity, religion, and culture, and gender. She's a different gender. That was then defined. Okay? You know, where's the church standing today? Francis would say on new borders of ethnicity, religion, and gender. Okay? Then he has this wonderful dialogue. You know, actually, those of you who preach, that is a homiletic pastor's dream. Because the, the text is so rich and you sound brilliant, but it's all just Jesus or, or Mark, you know. So he says this. He says to the woman, he says, um, um, the woman says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me and cure my daughter. And then one of the more curious things Jesus is going to say in all of Scripture, he says, no. He said, it's... I've come to for only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's not fair to take the bread of the children and give it to the house dogs. Now, there you have a pastor line for you. <laughs> I work with dogs, okay? And then the woman says, well, I'm going to sue you. And, you, know, you, you know. <laughs> no, she's on her feet. She says, ah, yes, Lord Adonai. Notice she changes the, the inscription. Ah, yes, Lord Adonai. I said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And Jesus says, wow. In all of Israel, I never saw faith like yours. It gives you the miracle. What happened? Okay. Imagine this scenario. Most of you are familiar. You know what an RCAA is. So imagine you have an RCAA program in your, in your parish. And um, 
you're leading the RCIA, you lead these people through nine months of process, and now it's, it's the Easter Vigil, and you're putting water in the baptismal font, and they've been on retreat, and everybody's excited, and so on. And some woman you've never seen before comes up and said, are you leading the RCIA here? So yes, yeah, I'd like to be baptized tonight. Now what do you think her chances are? <laughs> no, because you'd answer like Jesus, you'd say no, it's not fair, you know. I'm dealing with the people who are doing the RCIA, and it's not fair just, you know, they did nine months here, you've done nothing, come back Monday, we'll sign you up at the office, okay? But then this person says, sorry, sorry, I, I can see I misaddressed you. You aren't just the RCIA leader here, are you also a universal, universal instrument of salvation for all people, whether in the RCIA or not? You'd have to say, yes. And say, well, I'm one of yours. Here I am. <laughs> if you're like Jesus, say, wow, you've skipped all this training. You're more ready than the people who took the training. Get in line. We'll do you first. Now, that isn't so much a, a question of programmatic, should you or should you not, you know. It's the two identities in there, you know. Notice Jesus, he is the son of David. He is the Jewish Messiah, okay. And under that rubric, he says, I can't help you under this rubric. But he's also Adonai. He's also the universal instrument of salvation. And under that rubric, she calls him to another rubric. He says, I can do this. Now, what you see in, the, in Pope Francis, you see in all the church, all the time, there's always an innate tension between Adonai and son of David. First of all, even for the church as an institution, the church as an institution, we are the son of David. We're the Roman Catholic Church under the Pope, under canon law, under our bishops, under all this, and we can't just blow that off. But we're not just that. We're also Adonai. We're also, the church is also a universal instrument of salvation for Roman Catholics, but for everybody. And that's the intention. And Francis is saying, let's make sure we're not over-trumping the son of David part. You know, incidentally, as a footnote, um, what about his answer to the woman? You know, it's not fair to take bread and throw it to the house dogs. Now, scholars say two things about that. <laughs> Some say that this might be banter, you know, and, and, and healthy banter. See, sometimes when you have a robust relationship to somebody, you're going to really throw it back and forth. If, if, if they're fragile as glass, your conversation has to be fragile as glass. But, you know, Jesus gives her a major shot, and she gives him even a stronger one back. So Jesus, it's not fair to take the bread of the children and give it to the house dogs. And she's saying, if you're a Jew and you're an idiot, yes. You know, <laughs> with the Gentiles, there's no problem, you know. <laughs> See, the Jews never let the dog in the house. The Gentiles did. He said, if you're a Gentile, it's really easy. It's just the dog's already under the table. You slept in the bread, you know. <laughs> but that's the banter part. The more theological part is this. Jesus is saying, if I do this, I need to step out of the house. To do it. I need to step out of Catholicism. I need to step out of who I am. So, no, you don't. I'm already one of yours. I'm already in the house. Okay. Um, see, Pope Francis, his, his, that's where he's coming from. Thirdly, John, uh, Jesus' statements on judgment in John's gospel. I'm not sure if we ever <laughs> read this. You know, Jesus says in John's gospel, says, I judge no one. God judges no one. That's very interesting. Francis says, who am I to judge? Well, he wasn't the first person to say that. Jesus said in John's Gospel, I judge no one, which doesn't mean there isn't a judgment. There's judgment. But Jesus says, truth, light, love, revelation, they come into the world and we judge ourselves. God sends nobody to hell. God judges no one. We judge ourselves like God puts out light, truth, revelation, love, and then we judge ourselves under that. We're doing the judging, you know. Um, and that's important. Who am I to judge? Jesus said, I judge no one. You know, he said, God doesn't judge, you know. We used to say, like, um, you know, or, which was kind of a silly argument. And people say, if God is all good, how can he put people to hell? Well, he doesn't. <laughs> we put ourselves to hell. If we, if we ever go there, uh, we put ourselves there. Incidentally, and I think you can say this dogmatically, I mean, without being in heresy, you know, there's nobody in hell who's saying, if I had five minutes over, I'd make a perfect act of contrition and go to heaven. 
God, did someone make a prick after contrition? I take it to heaven. You know, you don't have people in hell saying, if I had my life to live over, I'd do it different. If somebody in hell, you know what they're, they're feeling sorry for people in heaven. They're saying, if you want that, have it. You know? Um, see, we make the judgment. And we put the eternal part to it. God doesn't. Okay. Then, Jesus' indiscriminate dining with sinners in the Gospels. Now, again, that's the Gospels, not, not Paul. Scripture is really, <laughs> really complex. But in, in the Gospels, if you just take the Gospels, imagine we don't have St. Paul, just the Gospels. Notice that Jesus makes absolutely no condition to dine with sinners. So he doesn't say, first you convert, then I'll eat with you. You know, he sits down and eats with them. Then many of them convert because he eats with them, not the other way around. Okay. Now, Paul did begin to make some restrictions. He said, no, this guy's sleeping with his mother. He shouldn't be going to communion. <laughs> See, so with Paul, we finally get like there are moral conditions. If you, if you, if you, you shouldn't be going to communion. But if you just take the Gospels, that the, Jesus is this indiscriminate host, just... I sit down with everybody. Scripture scholars say he gave Judas communion at the Last Supper. <laughs> Didn't say, well, Judas, I think you're in mortal sin. This could be a sacrilege and so on. He just <laughs> gives them communion. See, that Jesus doesn't make distinctions. Okay. Then, Jesus' parable of the wheat and the darnel, the judgment parable. And it's a parable that asks us to be very careful, prudential, and patient in our judgments. You know, he says the parable, a man sowed wheat in his field, and along came his enemy, and he sowed darnel. And they came up, and his workers came and said, you know, if somebody sowed darnel in your field, should we go out and pull it up? And the farmer said, you can't. Because at a certain stage, wheat and darnel look exactly the same, and you might be pulling out wheat without knowing it. So you have to let them grow to the harvest. And at the harvest, then you can see which is wheat and which is darnel. You know, well, he's talking about patience and judgment. You know, this person's wrong and they're wrong, and Jesus said, care. <laughs> you know, be careful. You know, wait, wait, wait for the fruit. See what's going to happen in this person's life and so on. It causes for, it causes for very, very patience and judgment. And then lastly, I want to do this text. Uh, as an example of Jesus' tenderness, which incidentally Francis has referred to a number of times to this particular text. That is the woman caught in adultery. It's in John's Gospel. And actually, to my mind, is one of the great stories in Scripture. And it's, it's also a story that, as, as, as a, somebody giving a homily, you can't order it from the catalog better than this text. You know, This is the text, with many aspects to it, but particularly the tenderness. God's mercy. They said, one day Jesus was alone, motif, and a crowd brought a woman. And they stood her in the circle, they encircled her. They said to Jesus, we caught this woman in the very act of committing adultery. And Moses said to stone women like that to death, what do you say? Jesus didn't say anything. He said, Jesus was bent down, writing with his finger on the ground. He looked up and said, looked up at the people, not at the woman. And he said, let the person without sin among you cast the first stone. He bent down and wrote again with his finger. John said, then they all laid down their stones and walked away one by one, beginning with the eldest. Then Jesus turned to the woman. He said, nobody condemned you? She said, nobody, sir. He said, neither do I. Now go away and don't sin anymore. Let's unpackage this. One day Jesus is alone. That's already a motif in the Gospels. You know, and a crowd brings a woman to him. Scholars tell you that in the New Testament, the word, in the Gospels, pardon me, the word crowd is almost always pejorative, almost always bad. That when you have the word crowd, you can add the word mindless. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, when you're alone, you're more somber, you're not caught in ideology, you're not caught in hype, and so on. Crowds are always caught in some kind of hysteria. They bring a woman to him, they stand her in the middle, and notice they're shaming her. She can't, nobody's got her back. See, at least you get your back to the wall and you have somebody say, they shame her. They're in a circle around her. These are good religious people. And they say, we caught this woman in the very act of committing adultery. And Moses said to stone women like that to death, what do you say? 
And Jesus answered with a gesture. Jesus began to write with his finger on the ground. What's the finger on the ground? Doodling, memo to self? No, no, that's the key. Remember in John's gospel, Jesus is always God. In John's gospel, there's no humanity to Jesus from the first line. The beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was, I mean the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. In John's gospel, Jesus is God walking around in the flesh all the time, okay? And, um, and so remember, this is God. Who writes with his finger? God. And what does God write with his finger? The Ten Commandments. Moses went up the hill, and God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger in stone. Moses comes down the mountain. As he gets to the camp, what happens? He catches the people, the very act of committing adultery. Uh, idolatry. There's only one vile difference. They caught this woman in the very act of committing adultery. He catches them in the very act of committing idolatry. So what does he do? This is a great pun John wants to get. Moses broke the Ten Commandments. That's true. Moses was the first person to break the Ten Commandments. He broke them physically. And then he took the stones and stoned the people. That's a powerful metaphor. He stoned the people in God's name with God's law. But it was wrong. He had to go up the hill again and get to commit a second time. And the second time before God was said, Moses, don't do this. Don't stone people in my name. You know, don't use my, my law to do violence to people. I'm a God of mercy. And Moses got it. He didn't do it the second time. But John wants you to get that. Just this irony. Moses was the first person to break the Ten Commandments. Then he stoned the people with the commandments, which oftentimes we're doing. Okay? Now, um, the people got it, you know. And John said they all laid down their stones, and they walked away one by one, beginning with the eldest, Okay, then Jesus hasn't looked at the woman yet. Now he looks at the woman, okay. Why hasn't he looked at her before? You know, there's a motif. God doesn't look at us in our shame. When she's being shamed, he doesn't look at her. Now that she's no longer being shamed, he looks at them, her. It's like the Genesis account. When Adam and Eve are naked in the garden and they're hiding from God and they're trying to hide their naked with leaves, it doesn't work. So God gives them leathers and skins God even gives it what we need to cover our shame. So Jesus looks very <laughs> now that she's no longer being shamed, and he says, has nobody condemned you? And she said, nobody. He said, go. Now, it isn't just an ordinary verb. He doesn't say, no, this scene's over, you can go home. That's what's the, the idea that when God says to Moses, let my people go. See, they're released into the desert to walk to the promised land. He isn't just telling his woman the scenario is over. He's saying, go, I'm releasing you. You just crossed the Red Sea. You're going into the promised land, you know, and don't sin anymore, which in Hebrew was don't, don't miss the mark the second time. Now, that story has a second background. So one of the backgrounds is, that's very important, is, is the Moses thing, you know, because remember, they're saying, Moses told us to stone women like that to death. And Jesus gestures saying, you want to be careful about Moses. <laughs> he was the first person in exactly this situation who got it wrong. You know, and he, he meant well. He did this violence and fervor and stuff in God's name, and it was wrong. Okay? But the second background of this text is the Susanna text in the Old Testament. Remember, it parallels the story in Daniel, where Susanna, except in Susanna's case, she's innocent. Susanna is innocent, and they're leading her away, and the prophet Daniel is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he gets them to separate the men, and you know the story, and they haven't got their story straight. Then he shows they're lying, but notice how that story ends. Then they take the two men, and they stone them to death in God's name. Notice in the Old Testament, it still ends with violence, and it's violence done in God's name. In the New Testament, it doesn't end with violence. It ends with everybody going home a lot more sober and somber than when they came, and a lot more reflective. Nobody dies, okay? But the second motif is this. John makes it clear this woman is guilty, and Susanna is innocent, and you know something? It doesn't make any difference. That's a very important thing. God's mercy and God's love and God's tenderness and salvation goes out to the guilty and the innocent in exactly the same way. 
see God and say, this woman's innocent, so I save her. This woman's guilty. We condemn her. Incidentally, that's a very important point for pro-life. You know, where people say, well, I'm against abortion because they're innocent, but I'm for capital punishment because they're guilty. It doesn't matter. See, God's mercy and God's tenderness isn't extended to the, to the innocent and not to the guilty. When Jesus says, be compassionate, be tender the way my heavenly Father is tender, which means it doesn't matter. It's to everybody. Murderers, the unborn, everybody, and so on. Um, <clears throat> incidentally, a story I told the priests the last two days, a um, little footnote on this. I want to tell you a story and pick up the irony in this story. You'll get it. It's pretty obvious. But they tell the story of Captain Cook. And Captain Cook wasn't a Disney character. <laughs> Captain Cook was a real English anthropologist. And at one point, he went to the Polynesian Islands. And he stayed there for about four years. And he learned the language. He befriended the chief. Ended up living at the chief's house. And they were animists. And one day, the chief took Captain Cook to witness a human sacrifice. They killed a man on an altar, killed him for God. And Cook was horrified. He told the chief, he said, in a diary, I told him, he said, that's terrible. He said, you're a primitive people. He said, in England, we'd hang you for that. <laughs> okay. It's called human sacrifice. We're killing somebody mercilessly in God's name, what he call it you know, human sacrifice, where they call it abortion, where they call it, you know, um, capital punishment. Somebody's dying. And Jesus said, no, nobody should die, you know. It's interesting. Pope Francis often quotes this text, and he says, in all these moral situations, ask yourself, am I standing with Jesus on this, or am I standing with the crowd? Am I one of the people circling the woman? You know, she's done wrong, she's had an abortion, she's done this, and so on. Or am I with Jesus? You know, writing with a finger on the ground said, let's not stone anybody in God's name. Okay. Lastly, I want to wrap this down. Just the, the appropriateness of this topic for the McCaffrey lectures. You know, so Zoe, I'm glad you didn't give me the curvature <laughs> option. You know, and I want to address this, Mike. It, I think this is a very, very appropriate topic for you. And I say this, you know, not as idle flattery or anything. You've been a priest for more than 50 years, and I doubt that anybody has ever come to you in a pastoral situation where you didn't find a road to mercy for that person. You know, I doubt. In 50 years, and in all your pastoral situations, uh, you were always writing with your finger on the ground. <laughs> I don't think anybody ever came to you or said, look, you're too sick to see a doctor. You know, I don't think anybody ever came to you where you didn't find for them, a road to mercy. That in some way you didn't find a way to bring God's mercy and God's face of compassion to the situation. And so uh, uh, I think it's, this topic was just very, very appropriate. And Mike, I'm proud to have given this lecture. I worked for you for four years. You kicked my butt a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, um, you know, I hope that... Um, all of us were priests, that we, we could say that. See, in every pastoral situation, no matter who it was, no matter how guilty they were, no matter, I always found a road to mercy, that somehow you brought God's tenderness and mercy to bear on pastoral situations. And so, uh, and it's not an idle tribute. I think all of us who know you know that's true. So thank you, Father Michael. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. Yeah, as always said, if, if you have any questions or reactions, uh, if they're positive. <laughs> a topic right now that we're hearing a great deal about is medical assistance in um, dying. So when we, we talk about mercy, can you give us some insights, reflection around medical assistance in dying? Ah, medical assistance in dying. Okay. Um, let me, it, it's not a simple question, but I'm going to try to, 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 I can give you a sound bite answer that, um, and that is, right now I think we have to be really, really careful, and I'm not talking about slippery slope here. We have to be really, really careful that, that we, I think, <laughs> this afternoon I was talking a little bit about the passion of Christ, 
okay? And we have to be really, really careful that in understanding the passion of Christ uh, and, and what it means and how we give our death away, we have to be really, really careful that euthanasia oftentimes is antithetical to that, you know? And we talk with death with dignity, but oftentimes today we define dignity in very narrow ways, which means that you die and your body isn't deformed or whatever and so on. Um, that, that's dignity in terms of the aesthetics and in our, our culture. Jesus died a horrific, terrible, humiliating death. He died with dignity. You know? So I'll give you an example. We had this example in the United States some years ago where this young girl in her 20s from California with terminal cancer. So she took her family up to Oregon where it's legal and they had a last supper and then all these rituals and then they euthanized her and they died. I said, this is a wonderful death with dignity. Um, I think we, Christ's death is still the paradigm. <laughs> it's not the way Christ did it. But also, I want to say something about passivity. You know, when, when we read the Passion on Palm Sunday and Good Friday, I don't think we get what the word passion means. There's a the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. And we always think, well, it's going to be the sufferings and we're thinking of Mel Gibson and the ropes and so on. That's not what that means. It's more technically passivity. Passivity. If the reader went up and said, the passivity of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, we get it. And every other Sunday, they could say, the activity of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Gospels, the three synoptic Gospels, are wonderfully divided into two sections. Up until Jesus is arrested... And led away, we, we read about Jesus' activity. And in fact, in Mark's gospel, almost all the verbs before Jesus is rested about him are active. He talked, he taught, he did miracles, and this. After he's arrested, all the verbs are passive. They bound him, they led him away, Pilate had him scourged, Serene carried his cross, somebody else did this. You know, see, the idea is he's. When Jesus is arrested, they're checking him into palliative care. Now, he's going to hospice. And see, and up until then, he'd been doing things. And now, things are being done to him. He's dying. And he's going to die a horrific, because crucifixion was one horrific death. There was nothing beautiful about crucifixion, okay? And now, it's interesting, we see, we were saved as much or more by that one day when he couldn't do anything than during those three and a half years when he did everything. See, that's the mystery of passivity. It's a very deep mystery. And see, almost all talk with euthanasia and death with dignity bypasses that. Let me give you a story. You want to read this book, Heather King, who's an L.A.-based author, okay, who is actually writing books now on, on Carmelite spirituality. But she, she wrote her autobiography some years ago, and then she tells this story. She says, when, she says I grew up, Irish family, well, second generation Irish, says, and my five siblings, says, and my dad's alcoholism completely destroyed the family. Said, so by the time my dad died, the siblings, we were adults, we couldn't stand each other, we couldn't be in a room with each other. Said, and my mother tried to hold it together. Said, and during the rest of her life, my mother tried to reconcile us. She'd call us together, she'd try to bring in anything to try to make peace, to bring the kids together, and she couldn't do it. Then she died. She died of cancer. Said, and during the last 10 days, she was in hospice. And, said, and during the last days, she was completely unconscious. She couldn't speak. You know what happened? Like all the kids came to the vigil with their mother's death, they reconciled. See, her mother was able to do in her passivity what she couldn't do in her activity. All the years she cajoled and so on and tried to get, she couldn't bring them together. Now when she couldn't do anything, she's lying there with tubes and dying, she did it. Jesus did the same thing. Three and a half years he taught and preached and taught and did miracles, and we didn't get it. In the one day when he died, we got it. You know, he reconciled this. Remember, we say, he reconciled in his death. You know, see, and see, what's dangerous about talk of, of, um, of um, you know, um, medical assistance, medical assistance and so on, or youth, however you put it, and so on. Okay. I'm not sure what the technical or politically correct words are, but every way you put it, I'm not coming at this through legal ways or something. My perspective was the passion of Christ and the mystery of passivity. 
you know, and what we're going to lose if we do this, and then also how do we define dignity? You know, see, I think today we define dignity aesthetically, you know. Like, no, if I've watched many people and brothers and sisters die of cancer. It's horrible. It's awful. You have a beautiful person in their bodies, you know. If you ever watch somebody die of cancer, it ain't pretty. But neither was the crucifixion. <laughs> you know, uh, the crucifixion, we've glamorized and we've surrounded it with roses. But, you know, the Romans designed crucifixion with a couple of things in mind. One of them was the death penalty. But they wanted to be a deterrent, so they had two other things attached to it. One of them was to inflict the optimum amount of pain that is possible for you being to suffer. That's why they even gave morphine during the crucifixion. Not to dull the pain, to keep the person alive longer, so they'd suffer longer. But the third thing, even more perniciously, it was designed to utterly humiliate the body. And so the person was stripped naked. You now we put a towel around Jesus. They were stripped naked, naked so their genitals were exposed. And on the cross, they would go into convulsions, their bowels would loosen and so on. It was horrific, you know. When you see people die oftentimes of cancer and so on, and today we have morphine and so on, it's pretty awful. And people say, well, that's not dying with dignity. If you're defining dignity aesthetically, if you're defining dignity in terms of the gospel, it's something different, you know? And see, so we have to be really careful that we don't define, you know, a dignified death in an aesthetic way and then deprive ourselves. It's not, I'm not worried about mortal sins and God being upset and people going to hell or whatever. I'm worried about the poverty we're going to experience in terms of our spirituality and so on. See, we're going to be much poorer. One last line. Of, you know, when I was a seminarian and I was trying to read Teilhard de Chardin, who was a little beyond me, probably still is, but anyway, poor as a seminarian. So I picked up his book, The Divine Milieu. Very first lines. Teilhard says, we sanctify the world through our activities and we sanctify the world through our passivities. So, well, this has got to be a bad translation. That makes no sense at all. So I quickly ran and got the French book. That's what it says. We sanctify the world and we give gifts to each other through our activities. And we sanctify the world, we give gifts to each other through our, what we endure, what's passive. Jesus gave his life for us through his activity. He gave his death for us through his passivity. And, uh, and see, so all talk about assisted death, it's got to work through that spiritual equation you know, independent of legal or other considerations. But it's a good question. But I'm also showing my bias on this. You know, it may be more complex than I'm saying here and so on. Um, but I'm coming at purely from a gospel point of view. I'm saying no, no, and no.